stochastic model of the orbit showing the eyeball and this is the optic nerve which comes through the optic canal and um, showing also some of the muscles of the that are attached to the eyeball uh, these are called the extraocular muscles and uh, because they move the eyeball and because they are present outside the eyeball there are other small muscles which are in fact smooth muscles they are not skeletal muscles like this these muscles which are present inside the eyeball that are called intraocular muscles so these are the extraocular muscles in addition to the extraocular muscles there is another muscle which doesn't move the eyeball but it's attached to the eyelid now let's return back to the extraocular muscles these muscles are six muscles and the they are four recti and two obliques so you can see here for example the attachment of the recti rectus means straight so these are straight muscles we have a medial one medial rectus we have a superior rectus a lateral rectus and an inferior rectus here and you can see that all these rectus muscles they are attached to the eyeball in front of the equator of the eyeball if this is the equator of the ball then they are attached in front of the equator of the eyeball so four recti and two oblique muscles as their name indicates we have this muscle although this part of the muscle is straight but as you can see here that the muscle forms a tendon that bends around a trochlea a piece of fibrous tissue that acts like a pulley so that's why it's called a trochlea a trochlea means pulley I hope that you didn't forget that, but as far as the humerus is concerned, we, we studied that with the upper limb. Um, the dist at the distal end of the humerus, there is again, there is a trochlea. Look at the, the shape of the trochlea, which looks like a pulley. So this trochlea here causes the tendon of the muscle, the superior oblique muscle, to bend. And attached to the eyeball, behind the equator of the eyeball. Okay, so this is the superior oblique and the tendon is oblique, so it is oblique and the muscle is located superiorly, so it is the superior oblique muscle and it has a trochlea. That's why the nerve that supplies this muscle is called the trochlear nerve because it supplies the muscle with a trochlea. Now the other muscle, this is the inferior oblique muscle, again it is oblique. And it is located inferiorly, but it doesn't have a trochlea. And as you can see, that the muscle is attached to the eyeball again, posterior to the equator of the eyeball, unlike these muscle fibers. These muscle fibers belong to the inferior rectus muscle, the straight muscle. One other thing I would like you to notice here is that look at the long axis of the eyeball, which is called the visual axis. It is straight anteroposteriorly. And look at the long axis of the orbits. You can see that the long axis of the orbit is a little bit oblique, as you can see it here. It's not exactly anteroposterior. There is an angle here between the long axis of the orbit and the long axis of the eyeball. And so these muscles, the extraocular muscles, the rectus ones, they lie in the long axis of the orbit, not the long axis of the eyeball. And this makes a little bit some complications in some in the actions of these muscles. So for example here, the medial rectus muscle, the medial rectus muscle is attached to the medial side of the eyeball. And when it contracts, it will cause the eyeball to move medially. But for the superior rectus muscle, because it is not attached to the eyeball in the visual axis therefore when it contracts it moves the eyeball upwards but at the same time it moves the eyeball inwards because it comes from the medial to lateral side of the eyeball so it makes a, the um, the action of the superior rectus and the same thing the action of the inferior rectus
it makes it a little bit complicated, but the medial rectus moves the eyeball medially and the lateral rectus moves the eyeball laterally. Now let me use another plastic model here. One of the muscles, the most superior muscle that I can see here after removal of the orbital plate of the frontal bone is called levator palpebri superioris. Remember, this muscle was mentioned earlier uh, when we were dealing with the muscles of the face. We said that uh, this muscle is an opponent of the palpebral part of the orbicularis oculi muscle. So it is levator palpebri superioris. And as you can see here, the muscle is not attached to the eyeball because it doesn't act on the eyeball. It is attached to the eyelid, which is not present here, of course. Now, inferior to this muscle, just deep to it, is the superior rectus muscle. And you can see that clearly here that the superior rectus muscle is attached anterior to the equator of the eyeball, so it turns the eyeball upwards. You can see that the superior rectus muscle is in line with the long axis of the orbit, so when it contracts, it adducts the eyeball, moves the eyeball medially as well as superiorly. Here is the lateral rectus muscle has been removed from here. And so you can see inside it, you can see the optic nerve, for example, and you can see the inferior rectus muscle. This inferior rectus muscle, again, it is not attached along the long axis of the eyeball. So that's why when the inferior rectus contracts, it moves the eyeball downwards and medially. In a similar manner to how the superior rectus behaves okay now of the other muscles that i can see here is the superior oblique you can see part of it here and maybe try to find the inferior oblique that's the inferior oblique here so you can see here the inferior oblique muscle it's attached to the floor of the orbit and as you can see that it passes obliquely to be attached to the eyeball behind the equator of the eyeball. Back to our earlier model, you can see again the superior oblique muscle, the superior oblique tendon is attached posterior to the equator of the eyeball. And so when this muscle contracts, although it's attached superiorly to the eyeball, like the superior rectus, but it's attached behind the equator, so it's going to move the eyeball downwards. So the superior rectus moves the eyeball upwards, but the superior oblique moves the eyeball downwards, although it is located superiorly, but again, it's attached behind the equator. And at the same time, the superior oblique not only moves the eyeball downwards, but it moves it laterally as well. Now, just imagine if you want to move your eyes downwards, only downwards, then if you use the inferior rectus muscle, then it's going to move your eyeball downwards and medially. And if you use your superior oblique muscle, it's going to move your eyeball downwards and laterally. So which one are you going to use? Obviously, if you use them both, then lateral movement of the eyeball will cancel out the medial movement of the eyeball. And what remains is inferior movement of the eyeball. The eyeball moves downwards, looks downwards. Okay. And this same principle applies to the inferior oblique muscle. So the inferior oblique muscle, although it is located inferiorly, but because it's attached to posterior to the equator of the eyeball, so when it contracts, it moves the eyeball upwards and laterally. And so this cancels out the adduction movement or medial movement of the eyeball that will be produced by the superior rectus muscle. Superior rectus moves the eyeball upwards and medially and inferior oblique moves the eyeball upwards and laterally and using both muscles together makes the eyeball 
moves upwards. Again, I repeat that this complicated action is because of the disparity between the long axis of the orbit in which the muscles are aligned, the rectus muscles are aligned, and the disparity with the long axis of the eyeball or the visual axis. This diagram is going to represent the action of the extraocular muscles. The actions of these muscles are elevation, which is moving the pupil superiorly, depression, moving the pupil inferiorly, adduction, moving the pupil medially toward the nose, abduction, moving the pupil laterally. In addition, there is a degree of internal rotation called intorsion, which is rotating the upper part of the pupil medially or toward the nose, and external rotation, extorsion, which is rotating the upper part of the pupil laterally or toward the temple. You can see here that the medial rectus muscle can produce a simple adduction of the eyeball, while the lateral rectus produces a simple abduction of the eye. On the other hand, the actions of the superior inferior recti and the obliques is a little bit complicated. So if you look here at the superior rectus, it moves the eyeball upwards, elevation, plus adduction, while the inferior oblique moves the eyeball upwards and laterally. Both muscles acting together will cause elevation of the eyeball since medial and lateral movements will cancel each other. The inferior rectus moves the eyeball downwards and medially, while the superior oblique moves the eyeball downwards and laterally. So both muscles acting together will produce a depression of the eyeball since medial and lateral deviations will cancel each other. Regarding intorsion and extorsion, the superior muscles, both superior rectus and superior oblique, they cause the intorsion, which is the uh, rotation of the upper part of the pupil medially, while the inferior muscles, both inferior rectus and inferior oblique, they will cause extorsion, which is the rotation of the upper part of the pupil laterally. There is a simple formula for remembering the nerves that innervate the extraocular muscles, and this formula is LR6SO4, which means that the lateral rectus is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve, the abducens nerve, while the SO4, the superior oblique muscle, is supplied by the fourth cranial nerve, the trochlear nerve, and all the remaining muscles are supplied by the oculomotor nerve, the third cranial nerve, including the levator palpebri superioris muscle. Now returning to the action of the superior oblique, the superior oblique, acting in isolation, turns the eye down and out. However, some confusion might arise if we know that ophthalmologists are used to testing the superior oblique muscle by asking the patient to look down and in, as if they have forgotten that the muscle's action is described in anatomy textbooks to turn the eye down and out. In fact, there is no contradiction. If the superior oblique was tested clinically by the patient being asked to look down and out, this action could be mimicked by the combined action of inferior rectus and lateral rectus muscle. One would say how could inferior rectus muscle be involved and it moves the eyeball down and in. So when the eye is abducted, the inferior rectus will only become a depressor of the eyeball. Look at the red outline of this abducted eyeball and note that when the eyeball is abducted, the visual axis of the eyeball becomes in line with the orbital axis, and that the inferior rectus muscle, which lies in the um, axis of the orbits, its longitudinal axis therefore coincides with the visual axis of the abducted eyeball. Thus, when the inferior rectus contracts in this situation, it will only produce depression of the eyeball because the compound action of the inferior rectus stems from the fact that there is a disparity between the long axis of the eyeball when the eyeball looks forwards and the long axis of the orbit or the long axis of the lateral rectus muscle itself.
and this disparity is removed when the um, eyeball looks laterally. In other words, the depressing action of the superior oblique muscle only becomes effective when the patient's eye is turned in. Thus, if the patient is asked to look down and in, the depressing action of the inferior rectus is excluded in this case. As I said, the de depressing action of the inferior rectus is most pronounced when the eye is looking laterally. So if the eye is looking medially, then the depressing action of the inferior rectus is excluded and the eye is turned down by the action of the superior oblique muscle only. In other words, we are essentially testing the ability of the superior oblique muscle to look downwards if we ask the patient to look down and in. Therefore, it seems that there is no contradiction. The anatomist is interested in the direction of the muscle pull. Superior oblique pulls down and out with some torsion, of course, in torsion. But the clinician is interested in how best to test the function of that muscle and so wants the eye to be looking in before asking the patient to look down.